Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's um, let's let's just get right into it. Sounds good. I'll let you start and tell us what's going on with you and what we're going to be talking about. I guess. Yeah. So about me, I'm not I'm not a privacy expert. I just hang out with privacy experts, and I try to <laughs> try to learn, try to hope some of their their wisdom uh, rubs off on me. But the the absolute best. And kind of like the Bible on Lightning Privacy is this uh, blog post on A Byte's Journey by Tony Giorgio. He's a, a co-worker of ours and also doesn't use Twitter. So take <laughs> take that for what you will, privacy implications of that. But uh, yeah, so so uh, Tony has this piece called Lightning, uh, Current State of Lightning Privacy that he wrote last year. And uh, it still still holds up. And uh, it... it it covers a ton of stuff where you can potentially uh, lose privacy on Lightning and also um, steps you can take to to improve your privacy. But the kind of the, ba- I mean, the basic, the high level is that Lightning is relatively private compared to Bitcoin and Bitcoin is relatively private in, in a lot of ways compared to, you know, using a, a Visa card or something, you know. So, so you, you're already kind of, winning in a sense by using lightning so so that's that i think that's really encouraging and then especially as a sender you can have pretty pretty good privacy on lightning without a ton of hassle or a ton of things to worry about Mm -hmm. where where lightning privacy typically breaks down is as a receiver uh so those are kind of that's kind of like the really high level right yeah i guess let's so that that report by tony or that you know that thesis paper fact whatever you want to call it is awesome and it really dives into the weeds of how the lightning network protocol and infrastructure does impact users and what information that they might be uh, unknowingly sort of leaking to various parties, whether it's the peer that they're sending or receiving to their ISPs, their uh, the apps that they might be using, uh, stuff like that. So, if you don't let's let's talk about what privacy. Uh, let's just go through some scenarios, some maybe some basic scenarios. So, I just let's just say somebody downloaded the Phoenix Wallet for the first time with the goal of buying an Amazon gift card on Lightning. What privacy implications do they need to worry about? Do you think? Well, the uh, the big one there would be. Um, I mean, again, you're 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 doing well. Um, you're gonna have to fund that wallet, and so you, uh, as far as I understand, Phoenix, you have a you when you receive, you, you're receiving basically to your own mini node in Phoenix, and so there's there's like a, like a pub key associated, like a node pub key associated with that. So or any mobile lightning wallet that you can get from the app store, kind of. So there's an on-chain component, like you're saying. So if you send funds from an exchange that you've KYC'd on directly to like a lightning app, that that could be a privacy hit. Yeah, I mean, maybe maybe let's zoom out a bit. It's it's, it's a little hard. I mean, I, I don't know. I'm not completely familiar. Yeah, yeah. Come on. All the, um, it, I mean, basically every every lightning node, every lightning channel, it has an associated on-chain transaction, right? That's how you create a lightning channel. And also when you close a lightning channel, there's an on-chain transaction. So actually one of the links I gave you is, yeah, this mempool.space link. <laughs> you click into this. This is... This is a, 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 a story of, of what not to do. And this is my node that I set up like three years ago. And uh, wow, more more than three years ago. And I did a lot of things wrong here. Um, and and I have also since lost this node. I don't actually know where like the, mach- the machine <laughs> was that I think my made my parents like threw it away or something. I don't know. So this is a, a, a quote unquote node on the Lightning Network that's definitely not online right now. But mintpool.space can show you, can gather a lot of information about this node all through you know or mostly through just kind of on-chain activity and then also what the node broadcasts about itself so like the first big mistake i made is that i've 
associated this node. I named it. I gave it an alias, Future Paul. And that's my a well-known identity I have on the internet that's associated with my real identity. So I've like linked this node with my real identity. And then I have, and, and, and the, there are on-chain transactions associated with this, this node. So I'm kind of, I'm, uh, I'm in trouble multiple ways. So if you imagine back to that Phoenix scenario, you have, you, let's say you take a, 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 you funded your Phoenix wallet from an on-chain transaction from an exchange. So there's that link, right, of your identity with this lightning node now that you have on your, on your Phoenix wallet. And when you open a channel, with your Phoenix wallet, there will be that that th that on chain history will basically continue between the you know this KYC UTXO and now your new uh, transaction that opens this channel. So if one you know one thing that Tony recommends in his article is 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 that you would ideally you know you coin join your funds before you open a channel with them. So that you 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 want you you would ideally have you know uh, uh, on chain funds that have that are are pro are private in a sense that that have a good anonymity set because uh, that that's ultimately that's the whole game is that you want to have as it want want to be plausible that if you're if you want privacy when you buy this Amazon gift card. You want it to be plausible that lots of other people could have bought this Amazon gift card. And so if, if, if through whatever, whoever is tracking your activity, if they can easily narrow it down to you, like let's say you buy this Amazon gift card and you fill in the, the, on the web form where you're buying it, you put in your name and your home address, right? <laughs> like <laughs> you, maybe you did everything perfectly on lightning and on, on, on chain, but you uh, just linked yourself with this transaction anyways, you know? So that's that's kind of the, the game. Yeah, I'm just trying to think of, because there's lots of little things people can do to quote unquote enhance privacy. I'm just trying to figure out what are the most common pitfalls that are actually easy to avoid, but people might not be thinking about it. And I think that what we've covered is a good one. Like on-chain history is definitely uh, one that can be easily overlooked. Can you think of any other ones possibly? I mean, another a really easy one is um, your node itself, like nodes that you run yourself are... Um just gonna be on tour and and only accept tour connections and so that's a good that way you're not linking your node with your home ip address uh so that's that's a good best practice and thankfully that's you know that's uh yeah common. let's talk about that just for a second so a lot of these node in a box products like my node and umbral and embassy and stuff if you are running a sovereign lightning node on that, you it's by default not going to use your uh, actual clearnet public IP address, which is uh, important in the lightning network because that essentially uh, helps nodes connect to each other. So I'm trying to say it in a simple way. So uh, if you use your home IP address, like if you say if you install the lightning node yourself manually by command line, and you didn't really go into the configuration settings and do anything, you just turned it on, it'll automatically point at your home IP address. Uh, what that essentially means is that anybody that knows that your node exists, so if you have at least one public channel, basically, with anybody, they'll be able to see your IP address associated with your node, and then they can plug that into, uh, like, you know, uh, IP search and see your geographical locations, or even worse, maybe your node might be <laughs> someday, I don't know, some authority thing happens, you might have not done anything bad, but maybe you forwarded a payment you shouldn't have or something crazy, I don't know. And now, uh, now authorities can go to that IP address, go to your ISP and find out exactly who you are, stuff like that. So it's really, really important uh, to either mask your IP in some way through a VPN, which is kind of advanced or, or use Tor at this point. Please, yeah. please comment. <laughs> Relatively easy. It's not so easy, but I think maybe people aren't thinking about this this way. Uh, one of the best things you could probably do for your privacy on Lightning is to have lots of nodes, is to to spin up different nodes for different use cases. So let's say you're you're going to start a store 
and you're going to sell sweatshirts or whatever. So you're going to be receiving a lot on Lightning. You're probably going to be like hitting up uh, friends or, or, you know, buying liquidity, however you get like a bunch of inbound liquidity for, for this Lightning node. So you maybe want it to be a relatively, you know, well-known uh, public node. Um, and it, it's going to be fairly associated with your identity because you're going to be basically signing invoices that you present to, to people when they pay you saying like, here is, this is from my node. Uh, and that that shows, you know, what wh what node is yours, right? And it's associated with your web store. So people are going to assume this is your node, right? Um, and it's going to have all these inbound payments. So what you wouldn't want to do is then turn around and use that same node for sins or, 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 or like sins that you are like worried about your privacy on. So you maybe would spin up a separate node that would be your sin node. And you could create, just only create some uh, private channels uh, with that. And, and on that, on that tip, you also wouldn't want to just create private channels with the people you want to pay directly, because that's the one or one of the big ways you could lose privacy as a sender is if the receiver can assume that th there's only one source that this payment can come from. Because Lightning payments are onion routed, so they, you know, they can go through multiple hops. And so if the receiver is receiving a payment and it's not clear to them whether uh, that payment came from the, the, the last hop or from several hops before, uh, you know, then they don't quite know who sent them this this money again unless <laughs> when you are creating your transaction you put your name and address uh, or you sign you signed an invoice uh you know with um yeah if you you put it in the memo or something like that so yeah so so if you have a you i actually think that you know maybe a nice little sweet spot is for, for getting started i mean i work on this project with tony uh, called mutiny that tries to do a lot of these privacy best practices automatically so you don't have to think about it and we have a, a separate node for each channel uh, so that's kind of the extremes we go to because it's really just especially for for sending if you're not trying to be a router there isn't uh, a ton of um, or if you don't need just a ton of inbound liquidity from a bunch of different sources uh, there isn't a ton of upside to having a bunch of different channels of a bunch of different provenances all all on one node so you can kind of you can kind of isolate them per node but yeah having a send node that you just have some private channels open preferably not with your you your own utxos uh, that's something that tony kind of explains in this piece and then uh you know a receiving node that that has a lot of inbound and then you could have a routing node and the cool thing about a routing node is if you're not making you know personal you, I don't think it's that big of a deal to say, hey, this is my routing node. This is Future Paul's routing node because I'm, I'm not making payments with it. I'm just, you know, I'm just trying to earn some the, a risk-free rate. <laughs> oh, boy. Yeah, no, we've had this conversation a few times. You know, uh, there's some there, there could be plugs out there that really want to have a routing lightning node and put some funds on there and just stay a non, and that's totally cool. And then that pleb might also be like, wow, you know, I could spool a BTC pay server and I can sell art or something. And at that point, you have to ask yourself, okay, well, do I want my routing node to be generating these invoices or should I start up a new one that is strictly focused on this use case? Hmm. And then the, the flow could be have these two nodes, they're getting paid, people are buying, you know, prints of their art or whatever and they love it whatever their uh, their channels get full of outbound and then they close the channel send those funds off to coin join coin join them up and now they got now they can uh, open up more channels on their routing node and that cuts that link between both the nodes right yeah I, to be honest i don't know all the implications of, of yeah. um, linking them but i i assume that that is probably um the, the main thing to be careful with is if you are let's say you have all your bitcoin in cold storage and you're um you, you just got to be careful with your utxo history that you don't kind of mm -hmm. especially if you, you know you have like uh like good coin joined utxos 
um, with a nice, nice clean history and that you are going to, you can kind of reassociate them with each other. So you, you just kind of have to keep, you know, I, and I don't think there's really great tools right now to help you do right. this, but that's just something that to, to keep in mind is that you know, when you're closing out your channels or when you're opening channels, uh, you can, you can start to, you, you can potentially associate various unrelated nodes uh, with the same uh, UTXO history, uh, and yes. that might um, that might ruin all your plans. Yeah, one of the hardest things is keeping your UTXO straight, <laughs> for sure, and especially on something like an LND node where you're likely going to be using Thunderhub most often, uh, and Thunderhub does not have UTXO control on it. It is very easy to open up a channel, still have funds left in the on-chain component of the wallet, send more funds in, open another channel. Now you're combining UTXOs, and it just gets really sloppy from there. And I, I, for me, a good rule of thumb has been empty out the on-chain part of your Lightning node before sending new funds to it. And uh, that's probably not a panacea or whatever, but it's it's kind of like the only thing you can do. Yeah, I think Tony kind of rec recommends something something similar. You know, deleting your uh, depleting a channel completely and and closing it out. Yeah, kind of kind of having uh, trying to get a little bit of atomicity just to to help keep track of this. I mean, uh, Ben uh, Ben Carmen, who also worked on the the Lightning Privacy Research. Actually, we haven't talked about that yet. We can we can get into that. He's working on this thing called uh, Lightning Vortex, uh, where you can coin join into a channel so if you imagine like the current best practice for privacy if you have kyc sats is that you would coin join them uh and then you use the output from that coin join to do a channel you know then you do a separate transaction into a channel open so this kind of uh shortcuts one of those steps there's actually i think it, the the link to the lightning privacy research if you go to channel coin joins there's a I guess there's no graphic for that but it kind of kind of goes into that so so that could be exciting but one of his problems he's running into is the uh, the coin control in something like LD these various node implementations have basically their own on-chain wallets right so you you might have your cold storage wallet but then you move into this hot wallet that is um, kind of a whole new setup and he's having trouble apparently you know, making sure that he can guide the users into a, a, a way of not re <laughs> relinking these funds after after they've been coin joined so yeah. um, that that's that's just yeah definitely something to keep in mind that the coin control is because the the most of these lightning implementations don't or, or even the UIs built on top of them like Thunderhub don't have really great coin control that that's something that can can be a problem and again it's kind of an, a, another reason to to uh, have separate nodes as much of a headache as that is the magical thing and I still don't know why. Uh, but if you have your Zeus mobile app connected to your LND node, you have UTXO control if you do it through your Zeus app. There you go. So if you really, really need to do it, do that. But if you can't do that, then it's probably a good idea to sweep any, like get all your on-chain funds off of your Lightning node before sending more on-chain funds onto it. Mm. It's probably a, a basic rule of thumb i would suggest to avoid commingling uh those outputs Woo, yeah. this is fun <laughs> yeah, <go ahead. laughs> yeah i thought maybe we could we could go in a little bit into the the lightning privacy research yeah so this is like i mean maybe this is not necessarily inter-level stuff but i think it's really interesting because there, there are, there's a lot of stuff that's being sort of in the works that can improve privacy on Lightning, the existing things that, that do exist, and uh, also especially improvements for receiver privacy. So the way it could potentially uh, work with, for instance, uh, like blinded paths is because right now Lightning is source routed. So the, the sender creates a route, and so they need to know what the node pub key of the receiver is and again that node pub key is linkable to on-chain transaction yada yada so the the sender looks at the gets this invoice looks at it's like hmm where where is a route of my awareness of the lightning network how 
how, how can I find the minimum amount of hops or the lowest fee or whatever metric they want to choose to route this payment to this receiver? What Blinded Routes does is that invoice can inc- include basically a, a an encrypted last few hops of that route. So the sender will send to basically an intermediate hop who will then decrypt the rest of the route and send it on to the receiver. So it's, a, it's potentially a huge improvement for, for receiver privacy. There's definitely some downsides. Longer routes have less reliability and um, also the invoices would potentially be a lot bigger. Uh, so it's not it's not going to be a silver bullet, but I think that's mm-hmm. going to be that'd be a really really interesting one. Yeah, and for those that are asking themselves, why would a receiver care about privacy? And there's a couple things there. One is any of the current Bolt Eleven, they're called invoices that you make, can easily be decoded to show the public key of the destination node and you might be operating a business or something and you uh, are generating invoices and someone decodes that you might not want them knowing what your total public capacity is of your node you might not want them to know who your peers are all that stuff can be easily found now and this idea would uh, prevent the sender from being able to sort of sniff out information about the the node that they are paying right yeah yeah that's i mean again i um <laughs> uh that that mempool about space link like yeah uh, I, right. I, I mean if you go on like you can browse around on mempool.space or also like one ml and just like look up random nodes and like see how much information that you can get about yeah. them. the cool thing too if if blinded paths and everything becomes standard it might be less important now to run multiple nodes for multiple functions like we were talking about earlier like if my receiving destination can't be found out to begin with maybe i do want to use my routing node as a uh, as a merchant node also but i'm sure that deep in the weeds there with probing and all this crazy stuff people do it it is probably still a bad idea but uh yeah i haven't even thought that far ahead of what what whether the the multi node thing will still be required i mean the nice thing is it, it is it, if if you have the right tools you know making a lot of nodes like making a separate node per channel uh, you know, in Mutiny is not really been that hard of a thing for us to do. There's some some complications about trying to give those, you know, make them act together as sort of unified balance. But there are definitely, you know, the, at the end of the day, like what a node is, is pretty simple. The the state that you have to store for all your nodes is is a lot more work from an implementation perspective. But the, the, just mm-hmm. the node itself is kind of a small well, implementation detail like for instance like moon sort of makes these uh seemingly fi- i don't know exactly how it works but basically a fake destination node when you receive on moon that then will with a route hint to one of moon's actual nodes and so you're this kind of you're a pretty um, anonymous uh, destination. It, it might become obvious to somebody that they're paying a moon user, but it's not really obvious which moon user it is because this destination is basically fake. It's ephemeral, kind of you know, made on the spot. Interesting. So, what else is in the uh, the published paper? Or do you want to talk about mutiny a little bit and just I don't know? I'll let you uh, pick a topic there. Yeah. Well, I guess the other thing in the, the lightning privacy paper is, I and mean, the big the big one is is PTLCs. So, so right now, when you you construct a route and you send this you know this this onion package along this route, and each step you know de- decrypts what they are allowed to decrypt which is basically just to see which next part of the path sh- should they send it along. So, so you know, intermediate hops don't know everything about your payment. They don't necessarily know the final destination or the source. Uh, but the big thing that they do know is this, the HTLC, the, there's basically like a stable identifier across all of these hops. So if you were the bad guy and were multiple hops in a route, you could uh, potentially, even if somebody did their best to make a, like a nice long multi-hop route to, to you know, have really good practice, 
privacy, they might be able to detect like, oh, I know who this is from and I see where it's going because they saw this stable identifier in multiple steps of the route. PTLCs uh, use fancy cryptography it's like we're you know it's like elliptic curve kind of math so that the upshot is that the what the identifier looks like at each step of the route is different so that would be a you know a really big win and so a lot of the stuff in like kind of the routing analysis section is like okay let's hopefully we get ptlcs and then if we got ptlcs here's some even crazier stuff we could look into like you know like timing delays and like size correlations there's you know you can be as paranoid as you want to be if you're really really going for the ultimate privacy but ptlcs are going to be a big privacy upgrade and um they're uh everybody's kind of working on them but i don't think there's any you know real concrete implementations ready yeah it's uh feels early <laughs> and and then with mutiny, yeah, the the idea with mutiny is a lot of these things that we're talking about can be encoded into a rule set that you could just sort of only let the user do the private thing, or at least you know maybe give them an "I know what I'm doing" button if they want to do something outside of our rule set with their their nodes and channels and and UTXOs. But but the default behavior would be you know, basically kind of encode all the, the, the wisdom and rules in this, you know, in Tony's original lightning privacy piece into just a, a, a user experience. And so like that includes, you know, the, yeah, the, the, the UTXO management potentially, you know, help people, uh, you know, get integrate. We're looking at integrating uh, Lightning Vortex, so uh, there could be coin joins in the two channels. There's we'd need a change in Lightning to be able to do coin joins out of channels, but uh, but yeah, just be able to. I mean, just don't let people set a node alias, right? <laughs> like it's problem solved. I I I wouldn't have been able to uh, name my node Future Paul in Mutiny because you just can't name your node. You know, um, um, so th th things like that. To, to be to, I, to be fair, I could yeah. spin up a word right now and call it Future Paul. Oh, know. sure. No, well, no one knows who is actually here, right? Bank, well, Bank of America official. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Bank of America <laughs> official. Who, who runs that? We'll never know. Um, <laughs> yeah, you, you totally could have uh, uh, spun up this note uh, named Future Paul in 2019. But, but yeah, but yeah, the, uh, the, if you, the whole alias concept is totally optional. People just like to do it because it's fun and easier than a bunch, a string of zero two or zero three, blah, 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 which is what the default is. However, the string of zero two or zero three, blah, 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 blah is much better for privacy because <laughs> you're right. less likely to dox yourself. And if you kind of related to this, just to kind of drive home the point, like, you really want to remember, like when you're when you're sharing invoices from your node, you're sending something that is like it's like it's a signed message. It's a message that's basically signed with private key of this node. So you're <laughs> you're you're providing, in a sense, cryptographic proof that you own this node. And so when you create your invoice that says for drugs and you sign it, you're <laughs> you're really um, <laughs> You're not doing it right. This is how I got banned from Zell. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, cool. If anyone has questions, feel free to raise your hands, but we'll keep riffing. What were you saying? Yeah, I just, yeah, just if, if, for, for the, 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 it's a reason why you shouldn't, you know, receive and send the notes, uh, send invoices from a, a, a node that you do not want associated with your product, with you, right? Because mm -hmm. you're creating these signed messages that prove. That you own that node but it's also you know for you know, so something to keep in mind with the received node just be real careful you know you just understand what you're doing when you are generating invoices that you're handing out you know signed messages that that are pretty obviously from from you or a kind of prove that you in some sense control this node when you, when you put something in that invoice that is related to something that you're obviously trying to do right you have to assume that um, when you give somebody an invoice that your node generates, you're also giving them all of your node's public data at the same time. All your channels, all your capacities, history, all that fun stuff. So if you don't want 
whoever you're giving that to to know that, then, I mean, there's other sort of workarounds now with LN URL and all that stuff. But what we're really hoping for is uh, for Bolt 12 to be pushed onto the, the implementations, right? Yeah, I haven't dug much into Bolt 12 recently, but I, I, I'm trying to remember the things that it would offer for... Because you're still... With Bolt 12, you're still kind of getting an invoice. It's just, it's being negotiated over the Lightning Network. And with you know, LN URL, you're still getting an invoice. It's just being negotiated over the web. Uh, so you'll still end up with with invoices. You know, you're, you're not getting rid of these node pub keys and these signed messages and stuff. But um, yeah, I don't know other, other privacy implications so. Of that specifically. Other than with Bolt 12, the nice thing is you you don't you know uh, you don't have to um, necessarily run a web server that would be associated with your identity potentially. In addition to you know to running this Lightning node. Yeah, it's just I just don't want people to feel like oh gosh, there's so much eggshells I have to avoid walking on or whatever. And it's like yeah, I mean they're out there, but you don't really learn until you really dig in and, and get comfortable. So uh, I think like the very the few like sort of like basic things we talked about like on chain stuff, like on chain stuff especially is like a big one. It's like the on chain stuff, the IP address stuff, and then the uh, invoice stuff for the most part. And those are like the three ones. And there are, and each one of those three is has a privacy implication to a totally different party, right? The on chain stuff likely has an implication to a KYC exchange of some kind. IP address stuff has an implication for your IP and location and stuff. You don't want to dox that to just random people. And then the invoice stuff for your public data of your node. So right. there's also, a to, certain age, yeah. to certain yeah. actors, <laughs> your IP address is linkable to your identity. So that, and what was the third thing? The invoice itself. Yeah, we want to avoid the alphabet soups. <laughs> yeah, I mean, those are like the three big ones that I, I try to help newbies with. Well, do you want a more more scary facts, or I'm trying to think of more, you know, practical advice. Like I understand, and I feel very similarly that this, this seems like a lot to do. So maybe I just <laughs> just not gonna yeah. uh, bother. Uh, and it's a lot to keep in your head and worry. Well, to, if I just get one thing wrong, is it you know everything is everything for naught? I, I guess it is. Yeah, it's really important to to remember that a lot of this is built on on chain privacy. So yeah, I yeah. think that's probably probably the way the place to start. You know, if you're going to have a node uh, that's you know publicly linked to your identity, probably a good idea to to fund it with in, in a good way <laughs> with, a, mm -hmm. with a nice clean yeah. ETXO history if you can. I mean, one of the worst case scenarios would be someone who has a Lightning node. They buy some Bitcoin on KYC. They open up a channel, and that channel, the, the KYC exchange knows that at, at least right now until we get the taproot channels the ptlc channels and stuff but like right now it shows 202 multi-sig it's really easy to be like oh that's probably a lightning channel and then it's also easy for them to go look through the lightning network to see which nodes open channels of that size during a given time frame and sort of triangulate your node you know all this is possible uh so be careful yeah it's also yeah it's good to to keep in mind that yeah you, you know um there's this concept of uh of, of private channels or also known as unlisted channels which is probably the better term that are are not announced to the network the, one of the reasons that we know the one of the reasons lightning works this way is that you kind of need to know that somebody's just not just making up you know what their capacity is and so there's so nodes announce information about themselves uh, or, it, it, cha channel opens are announced to the network and spread around via gossip uh, so that, you know, other nodes can know, ah, I see there's this channel over here. Maybe I'll use that when I'm trying to route the next time. So you can also make unlisted channels or unannounced channels, but there is a fairly distinct on-chain footprint. And then until recently, these channels were, the channel IDs had like a, were, Kind of deterministic based on the what what that transaction actually was but but yeah lightning channel opens look a certain way on chain and so they they can you can kind of trace from the on chain thing up to the specific channels sometimes even unlisted channels and tony giorgio did a proof of concept where he probed 
a bunch of, of unannounced channels and found a bunch of unannounced channels based on just having this on-chain information. But back right. to the TYC thing, like uh, another way to think about it is if you create a node that's associated with your identity that you're receiving funds on and everybody can see the transactions that have funded the, that node, if you're going to, you know, uh, move funds off of this node now, you know, that transaction, the transaction history going forward, you know, can be traced back to this node that was well associated with your identity. So you could think of those really, in a sense, as KYC sats as well. Yeah, I uh, I had something on the tip of my mind and it totally disappeared. I forget what I was going to say. The on-chain stuff is important. If anyone has questions, raise your hand. We're going to be hanging out here for a little bit longer. If anyone... Uh wants to hop up uh one of the dreams would be being able to coin join out of a uh, lightning channel and right now that's not possible because of something about the way the, the output is like predetermined or something so hopefully that, but that's a potential upgrade to the to lightning network that that could be supported yeah and honestly i think just to just to sort of sum it all up and tie it up in a nice bow before we get to Tim, I think that if you haven't started a Lightning Node or you're thinking of starting a new Lightning Node because maybe you don't, you know, you just want to start fresh or something, I think that learning how to do a coin join, whether it's through Samurai Whirlpool or Join Market or or something like that, that's a useful skill to have as a Bitcoiner. And mm -hmm. I think it does go hand in hand with Lightning privacy from an on-chain standpoint. So folks should consider uh, looking into that. And with that said, Tim, how you doing? Welcome. Or if Paul wants to comment on what I said. Uh, yeah, I think Tim, you're mute, muted. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah there, there we go. Can you hear me now? Yep. Okay. Yep. Yeah, uh, thanks for having me. I, I jumped in jumped in late, and uh, this is a topic that's very near and dear to my heart. Like, I've been, I've been operating Lightning Node for, like, a Voltage Node for over a year now, learning quite a bit, and, and, and I've been building out um, my own kind of experimental service that just went live just a few weeks ago. And I'm really focusing on like a really low end retail kind of payment system where there's privacy at the end. And the approach that I've taken is that like just listening to all the issues. If you're if you're a lightning operator, you know, the reality is is that you're probably going to eventually be under some sort of regulatory pressure from like a government or somebody else because they know who you are, they know your public key and that. And but you know, you want to be able to protect your, your the users of your system and you don't want them to be kind of like caught into the whole surveillance sweep as well. And so I've been, I've been building a system that basically it builds on top of uh, the light, uh, uh, LN bits and then I'm actually using um, some of the Xiaomi and Mint technology to actually create like a totally blinded system for like a, a retail payment system. So I, I literally have gone completely, um, completely off chain. And um, the other the other point too is the system I'm building is that the the funding source the payment in instrument can actually be switched out dynamically as well so completely transparent to the user so the strategy I'm taking is just saying oh you know you know we have the Bitcoin layer we've got the UTXOs we've got all you know stuff that's KYC we've got the channels that are opened and they they can be traced to transactions or whatever. And I'm really going up a couple of levels to say, well, I, I want to protect the, the, the users of the system, whoever that might be. And if, and if I ever get like asked to produce information about the transactions, I can just say, well, here we go. I know that funds are coming in and they, they get put to my mint and funds are going out, but I, I can't correlate incoming to outcoming. And I have no clue who's using the system. I've actually made a, a point of not collecting any personal information, not even, you know, I basically generate random, random handles that people use. And sure, things can be tracked with IP addresses and that, but, you know, at the end of the day, I have no clue who's using the system. And so that that's the approach I'm taking is kind of building building on um, what's already there and just assuming that that's going to be the infrastructure and then just adding on some other layers. I'm also looking at... Um, as I said, off off chain, but then there's the possibility of out of band and offline as well. And I'm working on a capability that, um, well, actually, I've, I've got it working. I just um, have it packaged it up. But you know, the idea is that I can literally, you know, one user can actually say, well, here's a Notepad file, text file of the of the of the of, of the the payment, 
and then that user can go and actually take that text file and redeem it for the corresponding funds and then clear it out through Lightning. And there's just no freaking way to trace it. So that, that's the approach I'm taking. It I just want to share that. Yeah, that sounds really useful. Yeah. 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 I, go ahead, I Paul. I really like the, the Chaman ATAP. By the way, does your service have a name? Yeah, it yeah. It, it, it just went online. There's a HackMD page called anonsats.io. And I, I, ha I have an API that's up um, called uh, asats.io, and there's a Twitter handle as well. So, you know, we're amongst friends here. Um, you've got my real identity, but if you talk about it, don't don't mention me. I'm keeping it pretty mm. low-key. Yeah. yeah and I really do like the, the Chime. I mean, Chime is great uh, uh, privacy uh, yeah. technology. And so thinking of it as a layer three on top of, on top of lightning is 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 really powerful because you can you can have this big big dom routing node that sends and receives lightning yeah. basically on behalf of these chime e cache users yeah yeah it's exactly it and it goes one step further just imagine you have a system where you know the coins are collected and then par parceled out like i'm going one step further with shami and mints i'm actually melting it down to the gold ingots and then reissuing brand new coins for every transaction and there's no freaking way to tra trace that at all like at all and then uh, the user can just live in that layer if they want for as long as they want. And then when they clear out, then, you know, I could literally um, put another funding source underneath. Like it could be my voltage node um, today, but then um, I can actually like put a num like a another funding source underneath, create another one. And so when they clear it out, like it, it's just, there's just you, you just can't, you, you can't, you can't track it, period. I can't even track it. So that that's that's the approach I'm taking. Adversarial thinking drives innovation. <laughs> yeah, yeah. What, what's what's pretty cool? I did a transaction this morning with someone in Africa on a flip phone with the uh, Majinkura system. So you know the one that does the uh, text messaging with uh, wallets, mm -hmm. and it worked like a charm. You know, I sent sats like uh, from from America to Africa, and they got them like two seconds later, and. Uh, there's just no way to trace them. Cool. Yeah, I, yeah. I see the site. I'll uh, I'll be uh, yeah. Keeping an eye on it. Cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If I can add, like, I'm really doing the super adversarial thinking. Like, uh, this would be something that um, uh, would just work despite governments and despite um, uh, like any like you know, it's not to be criminal or anything like that. But there's you know, we have pretty comfortable in our part of the world, but other other parts of the world, it's just not 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 that um, luxurious. And then making it super simple that uh, it can work for someone that might not even have a device. They only have uh, what they've memorized. Like, so I have like s uh, simple handles. So it, it's that, it's that kind of adversarial kind of uh, position that I'm taking. And, and, you know, privacy is absolutely crucial for this. So no, nobody should know, you know, it's classic OPSEC with uh, Bitcoin, but it's kind of taken up three, uh, punted up three levels for like the ordinary user the 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 big the big trade-off from my understanding with with chime and ecash is is the 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 rug pull potential that yeah the mint could just sort of you know stop honoring yeah these funds or yep so so it's it's not trustless um so it's all it's always you know these things are always trade-offs right so the thing is, is that if this goes operational, like you would presume that uh, the operator would have a reputation. The, the other part I'm working on is um, that I can work with uh, a bunch of other uh, operators as well. Where, where, where the advantage is, is that, yeah, there's trust there. But the idea is that if, if you should be able to clear out, your st clear out your position in two seconds, like if you don't trust the mint anymore, boom, you should get your stuff out like that. And one of the things I'm uh, thinking about is um, making sure that a criteria that I'm um, putting into the system that, you know, that there should be what, what, I, what I'm calling a liquidity ratio, that it should be X times of what I have in the system. So I, if I, so if I have 100 sats in the system, uh, the whole system should have by a factor of 10, like 1,000. If I have a million sats in the system, then uh, I only trust them in if there's like 100 million sats in the system. So, so that's that's a thing I'm, and that's something you should be able to validate in real time. So, mm -hmm. yeah, it's it's not trustless, but you know, um, and there's potential for rug pull. But honestly, I think the way to deal with that is just give the user the full flexibility to basically like abandon ship as fast as they want, 
And, and quite frankly, there's no advantage in holding funds for a long time um, because really where the, where the money is made is on, on, the, on the fee transactions. It's not on the holding or anything like that. So if someone wants to clear out, like, fine. That's, that, in fact, that's the way it should be. Sweet. I'm, I'm getting uh, – somebody's saying that the hand raising is not working. It's, oh, um, no. I, uh, I can't explain that. I'm sorry. Who's saying that? I'll bring them up. If yeah, we've bring got up, bring up Austin. Austin. Oh, Austin from Austin? Oh, Austin sorry. I didn't Austin. Austin taught me CSS earlier. Did you take on the dev course? Yeah. <laughs> it's funny. Uh, I don't know. Austin, I invited you, man. If you're not seeing it, I'm sorry. Yeah, if you're on a computer, it won't work. I invited him to co-host also. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. We, we got to get wrapped up here, Austin. I'm sorry, buddy. All right, Maybe final word. Check out the, the pleb dev course. Yeah, check out the pleb dev. Follow Austin. Everyone should follow Austin. What is it? At Bitcoin pleb dev. Yeah. Do I learn how to build? Build on Lightning. Yep. All right, guys. Uh, have a good one, Tim. I appreciate you coming up and sharing, and uh, we'll catch you all next time.